What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Watchtower Podcast. Glad you guys could be here. Glad you guys could join me. Uh, this is episode 101. Woo-hoo! We are over the 100. We're, we are past the 100. Over the one. I'm, you know, I'm going to stick with it. We're over the 100. That's right. Uh, yeah, glad you guys could be here. Uh, this is Saturday. Uh, and this is what we do Tuesdays and Saturdays as we go over all of the different things going on that point to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of prophetic things going on, that is for sure. And uh, like I put out in my telegram, you know, there's a lot of things going on, but we can't forget about the absolutely insane spiritual war that is going on in the church. And so we're going to take an episode to focus on that stuff. So like I said, this episode 101, Blinding Spotlights. Blinding spotlights. Uh, We're going to be talking a lot about music and how people are blinded by the spotlights of the music, but we're going to be talking about a couple other things as well on the way there. Um, There's just a lot of stuff. I had a couple things planned that I was going to talk about, and then as I was going, I just kept adding more and more and more, so there's a lot of things that we're going to be covering (laughs) today as far as this goes. But uh, yeah, again, glad you guys could be here. Glad you guys can join me. Um, and I think we're going to go ahead and get into some housekeeping. No, no reason to uh, keep mumbling and jumbling and I don't know, I'm losing my mind. Either way, housekeeping. Housekeeping. No, thank you. Sleeping. Housekeeping. All right. As far as housekeeping, uh, let's see. Usual spiel, like, share, and subscribe if you guys can. Uh, Get this out to as many people as you can. It does help uh, when you like, share, and obviously subscribe and all that stuff. So um, if you guys want to support the channel that way, I definitely appreciate that. It's not about views. It is not about butts and seats. But it is about getting the warning out to people and getting people to Jesus and Jesus to people. That's why we do this. That is the whole goal. For this. So if you guys can like, share, and subscribe. Also, uh, if you want to follow me on Rumble, Odyssey, and Telegram. Rumble and Odyssey are my backup channels. YouTube's inevitably going to boot me off, going to boot everybody else off that's speaking anything about Jesus and, and truth and all that stuff. So um, if you guys want to follow me on there, because when that happens, we'll be going over there. Uh, and then Telegram for news updates, announcements, funny things, hymns, anything in between. Uh, it's just sometimes I just throw out thoughts and stuff like that too. So if you want to follow me on there, that would be great. I'll see you over there. Um, and then also a couple episodes ago, I talked about how I was going to be recording an episode with Tom Hughes. Uh, Tom Hughes invited me on and I had the honor and privilege of joining him. Uh, As you know, he is in Israel right now. I am not jealous at all of that, but he's in Israel right now. And uh, so, not tomorrow, Monday, um, he will, uh, I, that video that we recorded will be uh, on his website, his app, uh, all that stuff. So that will be there. And then I think I think on Tuesday, because that's how it goes the next day. On Tuesday, it'll be on YouTube. So uh, look for that. It's, uh, it was a good time. It was a good time. I appreciate Tom. And uh, again, I thank him for the honor and privilege uh, for me being on there. I never, ever, honestly, honestly, guys, I never, ever would have thought that I would have been in that position. So it's crazy. Um, the Lord uses anybody. I'll tell you what. Uh, if you're afraid that uh, you're, just, you're going to mess up or something like that, I'm telling you, if he's using me, He's going to, he can use you. So yeah, it's going to be good. So Monday and then Monday on his site and app. And then Tuesday, I think it's on uh, YouTube. So check that out. Okay. Uh, that's all I got as far as housekeeping and all that stuff. We have got a load of stuff to cover. Um, and I am not exaggerating at all. I cannot believe how many notes we got. So uh, I don't want to keep keep you guys here forever. Uh, I know we got church in the morning. Uh, So we're going to go ahead and get going into this. Um, Except, you know, I forgot last week and I don't want to forget this week. So before we even do that, how are you guys doing? Let's get you involved with here. Um, We're going to start here just because I think it's funny. Pookie is telling me to go away. I'm not going to go away, Pookie. You said that last time. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Now this world says buckle up. Yes, buckle up. I'm, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, yeah, uh, what's up, Betty Lou? Betty Lou is here. Good to see you, Betty Lou. We've got Carly. Smash that like button. Yes, yeah, smash it. Make it unrecognizable. Hit the thumb. I'd appreciate that. Hello, Laura's here. Blessed day. Got a donation of many cat supplies. Ooh, nice. 
Uh, we've got Terry. Good to see you, Terry. Glad you are here. Jenny is here as well. We've got Loretta. How are we doing, Loretta? Looks like we've got Peach as well. What a blessing. The cat stuff. A blessing. Uh, Rev. Good to see you, Rev. Glad you're here. Everybody is celebrating the cat toys. That is fantastic. Uh, let's see. We got Pierce DeVale. What's up? Uh, Zacharita. Z Zacharita. Yeah. Or re T. I don't know. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Uh, Murky is here as well. Uh, we got Panachi Fabi. Oh, man. Um, I'm sorry. I'm going to butcher that name. Pa Panachi Fab Fabian? Fabian? Uh, from South, I'm not going to even try and pronounce that. Just going to say South Australia. <laughs> Glad to see you. Oh man. You know, I'll be honest. It's kind of funny. Uh, whenever I have a video out or something like that, I always, I always get people commenting on um, how to pronounce words and stuff like that. Um, if you guys know me, I just, that's something that my brain just does not just does not comprehend. So um, it's just a running gag. I can't pronounce things. That's just how we go. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny. Though. Okay, we're going to get into this. <laughs> That's enough of that silly sauce. Let's go ahead and get into this. All right, episode 101, Blinding Spotlights. So whenever I talk about this type of stuff, I'm, I'm just always going to let you guys know, I'm probably going to hurt some feelings and, uh, understand that when I say these things, understand when I'm talking about these things and I'm calling people out and I'm dropping names and I'm doing all this stuff. It's not because I have some vendetta. It's not because I have some hatred or I'm super picky about things or anything. Well, I am picky, but you know what I mean? Um, has nothing to do with that. I do it all in love because I care about you guys and I care about the salvation of others. And I understand what these people are doing and the gospel that they're presenting is false and it cannot save. And I'd rather offend somebody in love and truth than, uh, than uh, um, compliment, that's not the word I'm looking for, compliment them on the way to hell. Um, I'm just not going to do that. And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight. So we're going to be talking about some deceivers in the church. We're going to be talking about false gospel that cannot save. And we're going to be talking about carefully crafted worship uh, that is disguised as emotion or disguised as emotion that people think is actually the Holy Spirit and God. We're going to be going through a lot of this stuff. Before we do that, though, I'm going to show you a couple of verses and some things of why we're warned about these things and and we are warned about what is going to be coming in these last days and it usually starts off with matthew 24 3 through 4 it says now as he sat on the mount of olives the disciples came to him privately saying tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age and right here he starts it out with this and that should be the biggest takeaway is he's before he even gets into anything he starts it out with this jesus answered and said to them take heed that no one deceives you jesus knows he understands that at the very end the last days the end times the, the season that we're in now deception is going to be so thick that the only thing that we can count on is the bible and part of that is going to be the presentation of a false gospel and so I mean, right off the bat, he tells us deception is coming. And then we know in Timothy, 1 Timothy, he says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Again, deceiving spirits. And, it will be, and they will be bringing doctrines of demons. They're going to be bringing false gospel. They're going to be bringing a false Jesus. They're going to be bringing a false God. They're going to be bringing a false uh, Holy Spirit. They're going to be, uh, it's the demons and the lawless one, and all of this is going to be coming in these times. We're constantly warned about deception and deceiving and the false doctrines and everything that's going to be coming. And with that, we have to understand discernment is a major part of that. But I don't think, I think a lot of people do, but I think there's some that don't quite have a firm grasp on what discernment is. And I believe uh, Charles Spurgeon gave us the best definition of discernment. He says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right or wrong. It's important because a lot of people think that that is discernment. That's not. That's just, I mean, that's plain as day knowing what is right and wrong. No, discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. That's true discernment. And right now we know from the very beginning 
That's what Satan is good at. He's good at taking truth and just twisting one or two percent of it that changes everything. And we have to understand that discernment is understanding right and almost right. And guess what? That almost right is going to send a lot of people to hell because the false gospels out there contain a lot of almost right that changed the whole thing. And so that's why we talk about this stuff. That's why we go through these different things. We understand deception is here. We understand false teaching, false gospel, false Jesus, Jesus doctrines of demons. All this stuff's going to be here, and we have to be discern, discerning for that. Right now, there is a massive attack on the church and the gospel. What Satan is so good at is spreading the almost right. Like I said, I mean, he did the same thing in the Garden of Eden, and he's doing the same thing now. And almost right is not good enough. The full gospel, we have to understand that that is what saves us. That belief in Jesus and his gospel, it saves us. One of those aspects of almost right is, and I know a lot of people, just hang with me on this one, hang with me on this one, but one of the aspects of almost right is simplifying the gospel too much. Now, again, hang with me. The gospel is already simple enough, but just like many who add to it and make it complicated, people now are starting to reduce it too much. Too much. I've got an example that I'm going to share you guys. Um, this is some, this is one of the most powerful scenes um, it, it gets me every time. I was only going to play a clip of it, but I think the whole scene needs to be shown uh, in its entirety because of how important and powerful that I think it is. And it'll, it'll explain what I mean by simplifying it too much. So check this out. It's about three minutes. Check it out. Everybody bought it. <laughs> Except you. I knew your message. I knew your words. before you right now asking you God forgive me of my sins I am asking you give me one more chance to receive you in forgive me God use me Lord, please, just use me. He already has. He already has. So that's a scene from the original 
left behind and in my opinion it is one of the one of the most powerful scenes one of the most truth filled scenes in, in a in a movie uh it, it gets me every time and there's one line he specifically says if you guys haven't seen the movie if you don't know uh the man he was he's the pastor of that church and he was left behind and he was sitting there and he was pounding his hand. He was saying, I knew the message. I knew the words. But then he says, knowing and believing are two different things. And I believe Satan has gotten so crafty. He's gotten so cunning. Well, he's been, but spe especially today where the knowing and the believing part are the the knowing part is becoming the the gospel now that is getting presented and that is what i mean by simplifying it too much knowing and believing are two different things we're seeing more and more churches quote unquote revivals and evangelism where the goal is to get someone who clearly doesn't understand christ or his gospel to repeat to repeat a prayer and then send them on their way this is what I'm starting to see more and more happen now, where they're just trying to get people to repeat the sinner's prayer without having any understanding of you have to believe in Jesus. You have to believe in him. And so there's, it's getting pushed out there of just knowing rather than actually believing. And I believe that that is sweeping through churches. I believe it is sweeping through evangelism organizations. I believe it's sweeping through all of that. And there's going to be a lot of people who heard what that person had to say, repeated some words, and then they're going to go on about their life and they're going to believe that they're saved. And then in the end, they're going to find out that they're not, just like that pastor did, where he was left behind because he knew he didn't believe. And that's what's going on. Without repentance, without having true belief in who Christ is and what he did, repeating the words will not save. And so that is what I mean by people are simplifying the gospel too much. It's already so simple that you just need a childlike faith. But yet Satan has gotten to the point now where he's simplifying it too much. Repeating words doesn't mean anything without actually turning to and believing in Jesus. So this is why, this is why I point out these people, these people who promote a false gospel, who promote, uh, uh, who promote a false, false uh, Jesus that can't save, that their focus is on money and it's about numbers and it's about just how many people can I get up to the front of my church to say that they're accepting Christ, but I don't care how many actually are truly believing and accepting him. This is what we're seeing now. This is, Satan is really, really good, guys. Which is why when I see things like this, I begin to question if these people actually became saved. I'm sure a lot of you know about Satan Con that took place. That's not the first one that took place. There's There's been uh, several of them over the past couple of years, uh, but this is the latest one that happened. And you can see Sean Foich, we're going to be talking about him quite a bit today. Sean Foich claims 98 people saved at Satan Con. Satanic Temple responds, he's full of dookie. Uh, it's obviously censored there. Um, Sean Foich. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about him here in, here in a second. I get, a, I get accused a lot of things for calling stuff out like this about how I'm skeptical about it. I get accused of a lot of these things and for calling out the pastors, teachers, and musicians and my skepticism of events, of these type of events. But please know my heart. I want absolutely nothing more than these, at least one of those people to come to know to Christ. When I see headlines like that, when I see things like that, and then I see who is involved, I'm skeptical and I begin to question, I'm not sure if I actually believe anybody got saved at these events. And I get called a lot of things for that because I'm so skeptical of it. Well, why, why are you hating on this so much? You know, because I have seen 
Too many times a false gospel, no, a false Jesus get out there and people just repeat words. And I know for a fact that they don't get saved. And when I see people like Sean Foich, which again, we're going to talk about in a minute, the dude is preaching a false gospel. He's preaching a false Jesus and he's wrapped up in a bunch of other junk. But he also claims that there is a bunch of other church organizations there, uh, there to evangelize, and they're the ones who helped get these people to Christ. Well, when I see the pictures of all these people who are there to evangelize, I see, I just don't see it. At SatanCon, the evangelists that Foich was talking about included people, again, like Foich himself, Catholics, and these types of people. I'm sorry, but those people are not evangelizing to anybody. They are not evangelizing to anybody. They were there to protest, and to be Pharisees for their own belief system. That's why they were there. They were not there to save anybody. Guaranteed, if anybody even approached them that had the notion of trying to be saved, they got a face full of whatever that was, and they're never going to turn to Christ again because of what was represented. That's why I don't take things at face value. So when I just hear, hey... 98 people got saved at, at Satan Con. I'm like, okay, let me let me take a look at this. Let me look into this. And that's what I find. What concerns me gravely is Sean Foich. And I mentioned him, and we're going to talk about him. Many people like this guy because of his music, and he had his traveling, quote-unquote, revivals all throughout the United States, and he went into other countries too, um, specifically during the 2020 Thing and stuff like that. He was the one that was fighting against the lockdowns, doing revivals in the streets and everything like that. But people look at that, but they don't actually know where this guy comes from and what he believes. Sean, who claims he personally knows those 88 or 98 people who got saved at uh, Satan Con, he's bad news. First off, he comes from Bethel and is heavily involved in their music. He comes from the church, the cult of Bethel. And you can see one of his, his posts there. He's talking about, uh, for real though, God showed up and in, in crazy ways. And we ended in a party. And then hashtags Bethel Music, Bethel Music UK. So right off the bat, coming from Bethel, he already has the teaching of a false gospel and a false Jesus. That's not a good start. That's not a good start. Bethel, Bethel is entirely satanic, and there is not one thing Christ-like or godly in that cult. They are full of Satanistic teachings. It's completely satanic. He also runs with people like Hillsong's Brian Houston. That's, that's a post from him. Trying to play it cool while really geeking out on the inside because I met Brian Houston in the White House. The boss, the eagle, the legend, Brian Houston. Well, we know all about Brian Houston. Not, not much godly there. He also runs with people like Todd White. There's another heretic. Somebody who claims to have the power of the apostles and can make legs grow and make people walk and blind people see and can do all these miracles and stuff like that. He's preaching a false gospel too. And Sean likes to partner up with him. Remember, wolves run together. This is something I talk about all the time. Wolves run together. If a worship leader like Sean doesn't have the spiritual maturity to see the heretical teachings of Brian Houston and Todd White, he is unqualified for the position of worship leader. He has absolutely no business leading worship or writing worship songs for people to sing. He is unqualified for that position if he cannot see the heretical teachings of those two men right there. Not only that, but the background of Bethel on that. So Sean Foich also, and I kid you not, practices grave soaking. 
Straight from his Twitter, father-son impartation at Charles Finney's grave. Mantles. Hashtag mantles. Where have we seen this before? Oh, that's right. Benny Johnson. The late Benny Johnson, uh, who is the late wife of the pastor, head pastor, Bill Johnson of Bethel Church. That's right. They practice and promote this. She is also grabbing some mantle from Charles Finney's grave. Hmm. That's probably where he got it. Yeah. Practicing necromancy. Well, maybe he didn't get it from her. Maybe he got it from this guy. Yep, that's right. He's friends with Jonathan Rumi. And we know Jonathan Rumi, before he took on the role of Lonnie Frisbee for Jesus Revolution, he grave-soaked on Lonnie Frisbee's grave. Maybe he gets it from him. Wolves run together. And Sean Foich comes from Bethel, runs with wolves as a false idea of the gospel, and he practices necromancy. This is the man who apparently is leading all these revivals all across the United States. I wonder how many people are actually getting saved or they're getting fed a false Jesus or a false gospel from this guy, if he even cares. Or is he just up there rocking his guitar, letting God be radical and, and throwing a party afterwards? You know, that's, that's the question. Does he actually care? about that. I don't know. I'm not accusing him of that. I'm just, I'm just saying, does he? That's a question I have. Houston, white, roomy, Bethel, grave soaking. There's more. He also delves into the occultic and the mystic symbolism and practices. There's an ad and the movie poster for his super spreader movie. Um, and right up front, this is the movie where it was about the revivals during 2020 and all that stuff. Well, his ad and his movie poster and stuff like that has an occultic symbol right on the front. Can you guys find it? Can you guys find it? It's right there. Hard to miss. It's one eye. All of his posters for this movie feature one eye. And by the way, this is everywhere in the CCM uh, contemporary Christian music industry. There's Toby Mac, there's Skillet. One eye, just right there, not even hiding it. Right there in plain sight. It's not just, uh, it's not just that though. And right here, I know I'm going to get some heat for this one, but I don't care. You guys need to know. Casting crowns, as above, so below symbol, right on the cover of their Thrive album. Right there for all to see. They blatantly put the occultic as above, so below symbol on their cover. This is covered in so many occultic beliefs from the Emerald Tablet to the Baphomet to the Hexagram, Alchemy, Kabbalah, Buddhism, and even Helena Blavatsky has also used this same occultic symbol and teaching. And it's all right there. And guys, if, if the Toby Mac cover with the eye wasn't enough, he actually has a song called Il Amai, which is... The chorus goes, Illumai, 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 Illuminati coming through. It's written about the Illuminati. But people don't even, don't, don't even recognize it. Don't even recognize it. This is the occultic symbolism that is being displayed everywhere. One eye, as above, so below, everywhere. Sean Foich has got it going on. All these different bands have it going on with their type of stuff. This is just where we're at now, right there in plain sight, because it's not a ministry, it's an industry. A lot of people don't even recognize it. 
I didn't for the longest time. And I've been a conspiracy guy, tinfoil hat guy for a long time. And I didn't even notice it. And then when I finally got out of the, the, out of my own way, gave up the music thing, got out of the NAR church. And I started looking into this stuff. I just saw how absolutely rampant this stuff is. Now there's also a mystic practice called angel numbers. Angel numbers. They are mystic numerology where the belief is that our angels or our spiritual guides will communicate to us by using triple numbers repeatedly or patterns where it's like 8282 or something like that. But most of the time it's in triple digit numbers where you start to see those numbers everywhere. Psychics and mystics claim these numbers are directly from our own personal angels or spirit guides. And that is straight occultic. This is from a website, as you can see right there, the woman who's explaining it as a psychic medium. I believe that we all have guardian angels who help us make the most of our earthly journey by sending us signs. One common one being repeated numbers. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, Sean Foich has got a thing with the triple two number. He's got a thing with the triple two number. He's been practicing it since high school. You can see from this post, I'm not sure if you can read it because it's maybe a little bit blurry, uh, but it's there. He's talking about his number is two, two, two. And he's talked about he's, uh, that's been his number since high school and he's had it and he's been seeing it nonstop throughout his entire life. He's got it on his hotel door. He's got another picture right here. Again, 222. He's talking about the number is following me. It's trying to tell him something. His angel is communicating with him. He's throwing this out there. So much so. He's even got his album that came with a 222 key. He made a souvenir for others to hold on to. You get your very own occult trinkets and or totem. He practices occultism and pro promotes it as biblical. That's not all though. But this is where it really connects to the NAR, New Apostolic Reformation Church, which we know Bethel is, is in this post. Year of the Kingdom Comeback. Hang on to that. Kingdom Comeback. Hang on to that. And then he says, I posted this right after the Chiefs won the Super Bowl earlier this year on 2-2-2020. He's talking about that's his number. And this is Andy Reid, uh, the head coach of the Chiefs, his 222nd career win. So he's promoting it because it's his number. And he said, I declare this would be the year of the kingdom comeback. And that maybe was the first of many signs. Why am I bringing up this uh, kingdom comeback so much? Kingdom comeback, if you guys don't know, the NAR practices, teaches, and pursues kingdom now theory uh, or dominion theory. They believe that our job is to instill the seven mountain mandate, the seven things that are required in order for Jesus Christ to bring his kingdom down. They believe that we are to get the earth prepared for Christ to bring the kingdom down. This is completely and entirely unbiblical. This is a false teaching that removes so much of scripture, but he promotes it. And not only, not only was he using his angel numbers to promote it, but he was also putting it out there, the kingdom come back. And as we know, this comes straight from Bethel. Now on earth as it is in heaven, we understand this comes from scripture, but what the NAR does, and again, I refer you to Spurgeon, Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Well, what they do is they take something from Scripture, which is right, 
and they just slightly twist it to almost right to promote their Kingdom Now theory. Whenever you see an NAR church that is blatantly, I mean, they are throwing it in your face of on earth as it is in heaven, they are pushing their Kingdom Now theory. That is what they're doing. Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation, they all push this Kingdom Now theory. And the belief reaches wide. Those are the big names. People know about them, but a lot of people might not know about this guy, Josh Adkins. Josh Adkins is a man who claims the title of pastor, but is heavily involved with mysticism and magic. He also holds to the Kingdom Now theory, and his church, Loft Church, right there, is heavily into summoning, into visions, fortune tellings, and possessions. I've actually had an interaction with this guy, no joke. I have actually had an interaction with this guy on uh, Facebook because he was notorious for posting, I mean, all the time, posting videos of these revivals of his buddies going out to them. And they would do the place your hand upon the head to bring down the spirit and put them on there. And you see these people get slain in the spirit where they start falling over. They start rolling around on the ground. They start laughing. They're talking about how their body feels really warm and stuff. If you want to go back to channeling, when you're channeling a spirit or a demon, your body starts to get really warm. They talk about that. They start going with babble tongue and start all this stuff. And they promote that because they think that that is the Holy Spirit. They think that is God. They have the apostolic power to do that. No. And all that gets wrapped up with the Kingdom Now stuff. If you get into Hillsong and Bethel and stuff like that, they all believe that they can do this type of stuff. Well, we know in Scripture in the last days, well, there's going to be a lot of mysticism. There's going to be a lot of witchcraft that's going to be start coming around. A lot of black magic, a lot of white magic, a lot of this stuff going on. And this is a part of it. But if we look at this, I just want to show you this. From This is a promotion from not too long ago, March 3rd, on the Loft Church website. Now, they say a day of vision casting. Well, if you know anything about this church, vision casting is not like the business vision casting where you're trying to create a a vision, an idea, a step plan for what you want to do. No, what they're talking about is literally summoning and bringing in visions to get direct revelation from God so they know where to take things. That's what they're talking about with this. Then if you go down further, um, we also have two uh, Two House Church veterans to share. Prophecy and stirring up the supernatural will be done at the end as the Spirit directs. That is not how the Holy Spirit works. That is not how that works. You're going to be stirring something supernatural up, but it ain't going to be God. It ain't going to be the Holy Spirit. And so this type of witchcraft is all wrapped up in the NAR. It's all wrapped up in the kingdom now. It is all wrapped up in what Sean Foich believes and promotes and push, pushes out there. That's why I don't believe when he says 98 people got saved at SatanCon, when I see the evangelists he's talking about, and then I see the evangelism that he provides, I don't believe it. And it makes me sad. I'm not happy about that. Don't, don't ever peg me as happy that people didn't get saved. I'm not happy about that. That saddens me, and it irritates me. I get angered by it because that's what happens when you start throwing out a false gospel is this type of stuff. That's why I warn about this stuff so much. That's why I'm so heavy against this type of stuff. Back to Foich. We've talked about this Adkins dude long enough, but back to Foich. Again, remember, he comes from Bethel and he believes in kingdom now. Maybe you guys didn't quite get it. Well, he just blatantly puts it on this post. Till the whole earth looks like heaven. That's kingdom now. That's kingdom now. Anybody, any Christian worth their their salt who has an idea of the Bible and how things are going to happen understands this earth is not going to look like heaven until a lot of things happen beforehand. And he's trying to skip all that. 
Kingdom Now is trying to skip all of that. This is the reason why... This is, this is one of the reasons, because I know a lot of people know his revival stuff, but he also is heavily involved with politics. And this is one of the reasons why he's so heavily involved with politics, is because he's trying to bring about the Seven Mountain Mandate, the Kingdom Now. He understands he has to get involved with this type of stuff to pursue that type of thing. Then there's also a reason for teaming up with another Bethel guy, Chris Volatin. I plan on talking about this dude more. I'm not going to talk about him now. There's just too much. Chris Volatin, if you don't know, he comes from Bethel. He's one of the main, uh, he's the, like an associate pastor of Bethel Church. He's one of the teachers of Bethel's School of Supernatural Ministry, which is Hogwarts pretty much. And he claims to be an apostle and a prophet who can prophesy and teach others to do so as well. Show me in scripture where it teaches you how to do that. You can't find it. You can't find it. Self-proclaimed apostle and prophet. Well, on this little ad thing, Rally for America, you can see right there at the bottom, I don't know if you can read it. I'll read it for you guys. The kingdom is coming for America. Again, kingdom now. Again, kingdom now. This man is unqualified for his position of worship leader. This man is unqualified to even say that he ha has shared the proper gospel with anybody because he does not know it. And if his area is that skewed, I'll just say it. I don't believe that he ha knows the true Jesus. I don't. I'm not God. I can't judge his heart. But by the fruits that he bears, I don't see it. And it saddens me. It does. I'm not happy about that. It saddens me. Because he's probably going to be somebody that's left behind. Whether he knows what he's doing or not. That's where we're at. Again, this is... This is what's going on in the church. This is why I'm so adamant about pointing this stuff out. This is why I'm so adamant. And sometimes it comes very subtly. Very subtly. So subtle that if you're not specifically looking for it, you may not find it. Let's take a look at one of Hillsong's songs. Uh, they're called be be uh, What a Beautiful Name. Verse 2. You didn't want heaven without us. Hmm, that's not right. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Again. Now you might look at that second line, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. And again, you might be thinking, okay, uh, no, that's, that's not entirely wrong. But when you know that Hillsong practices kingdom now theory, again, that changes everything, right and almost right. Remember, we know what they believe. We know what they teach. So that changes everything about that second line. But you didn't want heaven without us. You know, I believe, I believe there's another guy by the name of Stephen Furtick that also teaches about God needing us. As well. All the way from Genesis chapter 1. Remember, let us make man in our image. God needed someone to show the world what he looked like, or else he would have just been a concept. God would have been an abstract theory. So he made man and woman to reflect who he was. He needed someone to show his nature through, so he made me and you. You hear that? If you're not paying attention to it, you'll miss it. God needed us. God needed us. No, Mr. Furtick, God doesn't need anyone or anything. God does not need us. God does not need us. But yet you're actively preaching it. You're, you're putting us on his level. You're putting us on that level. And as we know, Stephen Furtick preaches little God's doctrine 
I'll bring Furtick back into this conversation a little bit later. But God does not need us. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anyone. He doesn't need that. And when you start having that idea, then your whole view of God, your whole view of Jesus Christ, your whole view of the Holy Spirit begins to change. Because now you're starting to reduce his power. You're starting to reduce his glory. You're starting to reduce his holiness. You're starting to reduce him. And you're starting to push us up. But as we know, that's something that the NAR church does. They like to push us up. They like to make us the focal point of everything. Talk about that as well. But God is almighty and we are nothing. We are not even a whisper in the wind in comparison to God. He does not need us. This is an extremely false gospel, and it's a twisting of beliefs that are invading everywhere in these churches, and it's getting passed over without notice. Then, there's this group. It's called uh, Gather House. Gather House. Now, you, this one's interesting. You might not be able to read it, but at the top, right underneath Gather House, it says, uh, what is it? As in heaven. Even I'm having a hard time reading it. I've got another page I'll, I'll show you. But right there, they've got it right on the front page, Gather House. This one's interesting. Gather House is a group that is dedicated to nothing but worship and prayer. Their whole goal is to do 24-7 prayer and worship. So if we take a look at the second page here, right here, as it is in heaven. Okay. It says, we are a people unapologetically in love with Jesus, committed to partnering, partnering with heaven hmm. in 24-7 prayer and worship. I'll talk about that in a second. Determined to give our lives to the work of seeing his kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Say that again. To give our lives to the work of seeing his kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven through the life-altering love and presence of Jesus. Again, if you're not looking for it, you may not see it. You also have to remember Stephen Furtick. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. So when we do a little bit more digging on who's involved with Gather House, we understand that that falls right in line with the NAR. Before we get to that, the 24-7 prayer and worship. We saw the same thing happen with, I mean, people have already forgotten about it, the Asbury Revival, quote-unquote. That was also 24-7 prayer and worship. No message to be seen, no preaching of Jesus, no preaching of repentance, no preaching of the gospel, no preaching of heaven or hell or sin, everything that is pretty much needed for that. None of it's there. It was just praise and worship and prayer. This is danger zone. Whenever you see things that's nothing but prayer and worship, you start getting into a danger zone because then what they deem as for Jesus and worshiping Jesus and all this stuff actually becomes a manifestation ritual for all types of spirits and demons. If you don't have somebody directing what this is for and who, is, who it's about, you're going to have a whole bunch of people praying and worshiping different versions of Jesus. And then you're going to start seeing people who are going to start worshiping Buddha. You're going to start seeing Hindu. You're going to start seeing Muslim. You're going to start seeing a whole bunch of that start to come in because there's no direction, no focus on who we are worshiping to, no direction on who we are praying to. It becomes a manifestation ritual where you're starting to manifest different spirits. And it's not the Holy Spirit. Now, at this point, a lot of people might think, dude, you are reaching, you are out of your mind. I am not. Because NAR churches do the same thing where they're the throne event, 24-hour worship and prayer. Invite everybody that you know. A whole bunch of people start showing up. There's no message given. Even if it was, this NAR church doesn't have a proper idea of who Jesus is. So a false Jesus starts getting thrown out there. You see... How right and almost right comes into play? Do you see the importance of getting it right? You can't just throw out 
a different Jesus and expect people to all of a sudden give their lives to the proper Jesus. That's not how it works. We have to be very, very careful. We have to be very, very careful. Again, kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. This is a big, big sign. Now, the reason why I bring this up, because I looked into who was involved with Gather House. And again, I might, might hurt some feelings with this one too, but I was asked. I received an email and I was asked about a specific artist. And when I started looking into this artist, when I started looking into her and her husband, I realized that they are some of the leadership of Gather House. And then I started to look into who these people are and who am I talking about? I'm talking about Charity Gale. Charity Gale. So I did some digging on Charity, and I, I didn't like what I find, found. And I'm going to share it with you. Again, I don't take joy in this. I don't. I really don't, guys. I want you to understand that. I don't take joy in this. I do it all the time. I drop names. And I throw these people out like this, but I don't, I, I don't enjoy this. I don't. Her name is Charity Gale, and she is a modern CCM worship singer. I looked into her background, and again, what I found was not, not good. You'll see an underline sentence there. If I, I, I know it might be hard to read, so uh, I underlined the New Life Center Children's Choir and Advanced Children's Choir, the New Life Center Young Ladies Ensemble and others. New Life Center. So I'm starting to get an idea of what I'm looking for. I then looked at another biography that she wrote. This is one that she wrote. And she also put, I am, uh, I also run a student theater program here in Buffalo every spring. And I, and I am on staff as music director at New Life Center in Tonawanda, New York. So I'm getting the vibe of New Life Center. So that's, that's what I was looking. And so Started looking into it. I found this new uh, the website for a new life center in the Tonawanda region, but I wanted to make sure it was the right one. And so I managed to find this from her grandfather, Reverend David A. Robinson, loving grandfather of Charity Gale. And he was the founder of New Life Center United Pentecostal Church, Tonawanda, New York. So I found the right place. He's the founder of this church that she's a part of, so it's a part of her background. So when I went back to the website and looked at it, New Life Center, under their beliefs section, they talk about the oneness of God. Again, if you're not looking for it, you may not find it. You may not see it. The oneness of God. Oneness is complete heresy, and it's pretty similar to modalism. Now, if you don't know what modalism is, or oneness, because they're pr practically, and there's, there's a little variation here there, but they're basically the same thing. It's basically the denying of the living trinity that we know the scripture teaches. The living trinity, the Godhead, God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all at the same time. He is all three at the same time. And that's what scripture teaches. That's the true belief of the Trinity. Well, they deny that, and it's similar to modalism, where God manifests himself in different forms at different times. Modalism is basically God can only be God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. He can only be one of those at any one time, and then he has to change modes to get there. Well, oneness is kind of the same thing where he has to manifest, manifest himself as that. So Charity Gale, she comes from the background of oneness, oneness Pentecostalism, and she aligns herself with it as well. So that tells me that she has a false view of the Trinity and who Christ is. Now, I've tried to find some recent interviews of her talking about her faith. Can't find it. Um, pretty much every interview that I see is just her about her music and stuff like that. So maybe she came out of it. Maybe not. I do not know. She doesn't really talk about it. 
So, but if she still has that belief, she has a false version of Jesus that cannot save. And so she's writing music about a false Jesus that cannot save. You see how this goes down the chain? You see how this goes down? This is why I am so adamant about making sure, even if the song is doctrinally correct, and you have the idea that you are singing to the right God, you still don't sing it. You still don't listen to it. Because it comes from somebody who has a false view of Jesus. And I'm not just talking about modern worship songs either. I'm talking about hymns too, because there are some bad hymns from some bad people. There are. You have to be careful. You have to be careful. Right and almost right. If you, I'm going to throw Spurgeon back at you. Know, I'm going to throw it up there because I want people to understand this. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. We are at war with right and almost right right now. And Satan knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. I then looked into her music because I got some background. I got how she's involved with uh, Gather House, which seems to have an NIR view of things, and they want to do the manifestation events and all that stuff. I looked at all that, so then I started looking into her music and discovered that she falls into the same category of modern worship, which is me worship. She's in the me worship. Now, we also can find this in 2 Timothy 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. In the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. What we are seeing with modern worship music, with CCM music, is the fo focus is off of Jesus, it's off of God, it's off of the power of them, and it's placed on me and what Jesus and God does for me. Lovers of themselves and lovers of money. We'll talk about that in a second, too. We know this is coming, and it's here. This hollow, modern worship music that features repetitive, cheap jingle-like words are built to sell. This music is not built to worship. This music is not built to give praise and glory and honor to Jesus. It's not for that. These songs are built to sell. They are built to get views on YouTube. They are built to get listens on Spotify. They are built to get put into the CCLI license network. So when churches sing them, they get paid. When you create worship songs that are about me, self-centered, and focus on what God can do for me, and pair it with simple, easy to remember and repetitive lyrics, those songs shoot to the top of the charts. They're built to sell. They're built for money. And again, when we get back to 2 Timothy 3, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. The first two are right there in what is going on with worship music. Let's take a look at one of Charity's songs called A uh, New Name Written Down in Glory. It seems to be an original that took a few lines from the chorus of an old hymn called A New Name in Glory that was written by C. Austin Miles. Um, there's like a couple lines from the chorus that they took and used for their chorus, but everything else is pretty much their own, their own writings. Probably got it from the CCM filing cabinet, uh, that, that just, it's got thousands of pre-written songs for all these, all these people to, to sing. But this six minute song, cause all these modern worship songs have to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve minutes long. This six minute song features over, I'm not exaggerating features over 100 uses of I, me, my, and mine. And any reference to God, Jesus, or he falls close to 30. Over 100 uses of I, me, my, 
and mine. I'll give you guys a sample. Right here, chorus. All the red. Look at that. It's, it's all about me. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. He's mine. I've met the author of my story. Oh, his name is Jesus. Oh, hey, there we go. We got something about that. But it's, a bit, again, about what he does for me. And he's mine. Mine. He's mine. He's mine. Yes, mine. My story. Yes, it's mine. He's the author of my story. I've met. He's mine. Mine, mine, mine. You guys get the, the you seen the movie with the, the, the seagulls that just repeat mine, 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 mine. That's what this song is about. That's what this song is about. It's all about me, my story, and what he does for me. Well, if that's not enough, check out the bridge to this song. I was just going to give you a second. Look at that. That's the bridge. And it's just repeated. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. And it's just over and over and over and over. Me, I, I, I am, my story, I, me, mine, I. That's the entire song. That's the entire song. It's not about Jesus. It's not about his glory. It's not about his power. It's not about his attributes. It's not about his characteristics. It's not about his, it's not about him at all. It's about me and my story and what he can do for me. That is essentially what modern worship songs are. And it stems from a certain specific type of teaching. Now, I'm going to throw this back up again because I'm, I'm going to make, make a point. I told you I was going to go back to, to Furtick, and I'm going to do so. We take a look at this chorus. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. Remember that. Remember that. Well, when I was looking at this song and I read that, when I heard that, something came to mind because I've heard that before. Not the song. I've never heard that song before. But I've heard that line before. I've heard that teaching before. And I discovered why. I went in my, in my archives and I found why. Well, take it away, Mr. Furtick. But you didn't, get, you didn't get in this mirror right here. This is a mirror too. This is a mirror too. You've been struggling over external issues. But what about what's in you? James said something curious. He said, if you listen to the word and don't do it, you're like a man who looks at himself in a mirror. In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. My maker is my mirror. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You are not my maker. You will not be my mirror. When God said, I am to Moses, you know, my name is I am, he was trying to get him to see you are as I am. Little God's Doctrine. And they're very close to removing the little part of that. Furtick is literally teaching that when God said, I am, he wants, he, we're basically the same thing. I can't even say it. And that teaching that Furtick just put out there when it says, you know, I am and you will be, uh, you are as I am, that teaching, that's the same type of line that's being chanted and repeated 
in Charity Gale's bridge. I am who I am because the I am made me who I am. It's the same thing. Right and almost right. Subtle, but wrong. This is what I'm warning about. This is why I talk about this stuff. The same junk that Stephen Furtick, and I'll tell you what, Stephen Furtick, I know a lot of people, uh, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, uh, all these people. Stephen Furtick, in my opinion, is bar none, by far, the most dangerous pastor, quote unquote, out there today. He has got the young crowd wrapped around his finger. He appeals to them. He's got the look. He's young. He wears the tight clothes. He draws attention to himself. He does all this type of type of stuff that gets the young crowd involved. And he is teaching modalism. He teaches kingdom now. He teaches little God's doctrine. He's He aligns himself with people like T.D. Jakes and all these other people and stuff like that. This dude is dangerous. And you might be thinking, okay, you chose one one thing from him that doesn't mean... Well, here's another Me! I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's in me. It's in me. That was from a sermon two years after the first one I just showed you. He claims he is God Almighty. And he's teaching it to all of his followers. And anybody who has that view, who believes that that little God's doctrine You have a false view of Jesus that cannot save. It's that important. It's that important. Again, it does not matter, getting back to this music, getting back to the song and stuff, it does not matter that you think that you're singing to the correct God. I will say it again. It does not matter that you think you are singing to the correct God. When these people write their music and they have a twisted view of Jesus and the gospel, it does not matter if the song is okay scripturally and you think you are singing to the right God, you throw it out. It is not designed and built for the true Jesus. You throw it out. Stop with the excuse. Stop with that excuse. Why is it that important to you? Why is that song so important to you? Why is that music so important to you that you're willing to overlook the heresy and false view of the writer that you have to have that song? Think about that. Ask yourself. Ask yourself that question. If you're one of those people that makes that excuse, I want you to ask yourself. Truly, after this, sit down and ask yourself, why does this music have such a hold on all these people in these churches that you will make any excuse possible to have it? Ask yourself that. Ask yourself why you are so enchanted with that music that you're willing to throw all of that out just because, well, I'm singing to the right God. Why are you so enchanted by the music that you have to throw all that out to keep that song? Why? Ask yourself. Ask yourself why you'll make all these excuses to have it. Could it be that it has a white magic enchantment on it where it's willing to make you sit and compromise the gospel And the truth, because you want that song. It makes you feel good. The lyrics just hit you right. The tone is just right. That's enchantment. And it's overtaking the truth. That's how dangerous this is. People don't realize that Satan's greatest tool today is his music. 
but bar none people want to talk about well he's got the governments and he's got all this stuff i don't care i don't give a rip his greatest tool today is music secular and ccm christian whatever you want to put it worship music because it will turn people who have the strongest belief in the Bible and that it will allow them to compromise just a little bit to set that aside because they like that song. He's got you. He's got the little chink in your armor. He sees it. He's exposing it. That's how he works. He finds the smallest little hole and he worms his way in there. Ask yourself why you're so willing to compromise just on one thing. Come up with any excuse possible to hang on to that song, to hang on to that artist, to hang on to that music. If you answer correctly, you're not going to like the, the answer you receive. But hopefully you'll make a change from it. It's enchantment. The songs, this music is built for exactly that. Exactly that. And yes, even the sound Bible prophecy guys that we watch use this. They use the same music. I think, I can't confirm it, but I think only Billy Crone is the one that doesn't, doesn't use it because of his background. If you guys don't know his, his testimony, well, that'll explain why he doesn't allow that in his church. But these pat prophecy guys, even the sound ones that we all watch, they allow this music in their church. They do. And some of them will even raise their voice and shout from their pulpit to defend using it. Yep. Some of them will. And you have to wonder what type of hold, what type of hold does that music have on these people? You have to question. You really do. There's a psychological aspect to this. There's a spiritual aspect to this. There's so many variations of, of or variable um, aspects to how this music works and gets in and corrupts. Now, I'll finish off with that. But before we get there, you've also got one of the most famous CCM guys like Chris Tomlin, who we've talked about before, who I've warned about before. Stay away from that guy. But we have people like Chris Tomlin who runs around with Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, and T.D. Jakes. And you need to question why we use his music. Again, someone who clearly does not have the maturity to divide from people like them is unqualified to write or lead worship. He is. And so we stay away from Chris Tomlin music. I at least implore that you guys do. Then, with all that, he goes and doubles down and he teams up with Up TV to host Jesus Calling, which is based on the books by Sarah Young. Because Chris Tomlin just cannot stay away from it, can he? No. No, he can't. Now, a lot of people might be thinking, I've never heard of this before. I don't know who Sarah Young is before. Or some of you might be going, oh, I use her books. I'm not sure what's wrong. What's wrong with it? Well, I'll give you a small sample of why to stay away from Jesus' calling and Sarah Young. These books are written as though Jesus is speaking directly to the reader. So as you read it, it sounds like a first person uh, telling like Jesus is speaking directly to you. That's not a creative choice. No. It's, like, it's written like that because Sarah Young claims to receive divine revelation directly from Jesus himself. I'll say that again. Sarah Young claims to receive divine revelation straight from Jesus himself. No. 
Sarah explained that the Bible wasn't enough. I'm going to say that again. Sarah explained that the Bible wasn't enough. And she felt called upon by God that he was going to speak directly to her, giving her brand new divine revelation because the Bible wasn't enough. She would write down whatever she believed God was telling her. So as she was there writing, it was just whatever she sensed God was telling her. I wonder what spirits were actually talking to her at that point. And then she said that they are, uh, and then she took those writings and made Jesus calling the the devotional. She claimed that her words, this is where it's like, you, you seriously, she claims that her words are not inspired by God, that only scripture is. But again, she just claimed that God was speaking directly to her. So if you're saying that Jesus was speaking directly to you, Sarah, giving you divine authority, because that's what happens when God speaks directly to you, is divine authority, that would make your Jesus calling books on the same level of scripture. That would make them scripture. That's the whole point. When God breathes out his words for scripture, for the Bible, anything else that comes in the same form that Sarah claims that that's what, that's what she's getting, that will then put it on level of scripture. But she just said that it's not scripture. So which one is it? Which one is it, Sarah? Sarah? You're either getting divine revelation from God, which you claim, which would then put your words, your Jesus calling on the same level of scripture, or you're lying about that to gain money, making you a false prophet. And Chris Tomlin is hosting that along with Up TV. That's how it works. That's how it works. Any, and I mean any, claims by anybody to receive new revelation from God is false, and you run away from it. God gave us scripture. God gave us the Bible. He is not going to add to it. And he specifically tells us in Revelation, do not add to this. There's going to be no new divine revelation. We have scripture and that is it. Anybody who says that they're getting direct instruction or teaching or words from Jesus or God or anything. No, run, run as fast as you can because that is false. There's something else talking to them or they're just making it up. Probably for profit. Stephen Furtick does that all the time, by the way. He says, God gave him this to, te- to tell people. Basically he's saying, God gave me this to tell you guys. Well, he's then giving himself divine authority because God is giving him direct instruction to then tell other people. And again, run. You run from that. That is not biblical at all. Not in any way, shape, or form. Oh my, oh my. All right, so we went through all that. Went through Charity Gale, Sean Foich, the Satan Con, NAR, Kingdom Now, uh, uh, Stephen Furtick, Charity uh, Charity Gale, I don't know if I already said her or not, Tris Tomlin, Sarah Young, all, the, all these people. Guys, I again, I just want to make sure... My heart is not to sit here and and call these people out for fun. It's not here to I get joy out of this or anything. It breaks my heart because I know these people are leading thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of souls away from God into hell because of what they're teaching. Then there's the crowd that simplifies the gospel too much. Knowing and believing are two different things. Repeating a prayer does not save. True repentance and a belief in Jesus Christ and what he did does. That's what saves.
And so finishing this off, I was asked about what goes into creating a modern worship service. I don't want, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'll just kind of go through. There are, there is a specifically and carefully crafted order to these modern worship services. There is. It's specifically designed. They're specifically crafted. And the bigger churches craft them in a way where smaller churches want to imitate. And as we know, Satan is the great imitator, so that shouldn't surprise us at all. But these smaller churches want to imitate the bigger church. So these bigger churches who I believe the leaders of these churches like Bill Johnson, Brian Houston, Stephen Furtick and stuff, I believe that they're firmly uh, demon-possessed. I believe that they are possessed. So they have watch over how these services are created, and they create it specifically designed to Satan's specifications um, for this. So if you guys don't know, if you guys don't know my history, I'm not going to go into a big old type of thing from it. I came from two small NAR churches where I helped plan these services. They were smaller churches. I wasn't wrapped up in a, in a big mega church like the big ones, but I was a part of smaller churches who were trying to imitate the bigger ones. Um, so I helped plan these services and I'm telling you, they specifically design from beginning to end how these things go. Each church, again, these, these were small. The two churches I was a part of were small. Um, so they weren't specifically designing them like the bigger churches, but they were imitating for them. And so they were trying to be like Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation, etc. And they designed them specifically this way. So how does this go? How does this play out? How, how do... You design these things, what goes into them? Why do they make these decisions? Well, the first thing that they do is the mood and the setting. It's all about when you first walk into the sanctuary, when they, when the, the thing is just about to begin. Mood and set it, uh, sanctuary, or the mood and setting. Lights, house lights, stage lights, and spotlights. All these things play an effect. Um, you put them in certain areas, you put them on certain brightness levels, and you use certain colors, and it is a psychological aspect that will get somebody in a specific place for accepting things. House lights, usually when the service is taking place, house lights are brought either completely off or down to a low level, and all the light that you see is either spotlight or stage light. And they use specific colors and brightnesses on that, and like I said, it's a psychological thing. When you're seeing certain colors and at a certain ambient level, um, it starts playing tricks on the mind. Another aspect is background screens. When you see specific screens that they have, usually they have words, uh, the song lyrics and stuff on them. But background screens, you'll notice that they usually use calming backgrounds, uh, slow motion ocean waves, trees that are being blown by the wind or uh, valleys uh, of tall grass that's kind of swaying in the wind. Um, if it's not something like nature in a, in a specific way, they will use uh, certain shapes traveling in different areas. You'll see a lot of triangles, which again, that is leading into another occultic type of symbol, pyramids, triangles. You'll see a lot of that stuff, usually not sharp, but they have curved soft edges because again, that plays more for the mind of softening up the mind itself. All this stuff is particularly, specifically designed, and they use that. Some bigger churches, the churches I was in didn't have this, but some bigger churches, they use fogs, uh, fog machines, uh, where they'll put light fog either on the stage or at the feet of the audience. Um, some will also use glitter, um, like Bethel is known for their uh, God clouds or angel clouds, where it's gold glitter is raining from the ceiling saying that that's the presence of God. That's the Holy Spirit entering the room. It's actually a fog machine and Hobby Lobby, Hobby Lobby glitter dumped into the air vents. Um, they use that as well. It's a mind trick that they do. Pre-music. So not the music that you're singing, but the music when you first walk in, they usually have this ambient calming type of music. What they're trying to do is trying to calm down the person because when you're calm and you're relaxed, you tend to be more open for things that will be said to you. Again, it's a psychological aspect. Something that gets repeated a lot, usually by the greeters or anybody who's a part of the staff or leadership or attends the church, um, 
they always try and tell people when you're here, invite God in, invite the Holy Spirit in, invite Jesus. We, Jesus, we invite you here. There's actually a lot of songs where it's, Jesus, you are welcome here. We invite you in here. And they're basically trying to say, we have the authority. We have to give God permission to come in type of thing. They do that as well. You'll hear that a lot at these churches. Specifically designed music with certain pro chord progression and song structure. Now we're getting into the music that is actually sung on stage for quote-unquote worship. Christian contemporary music, CCM music, uses some chord progressions, the same sort of uh, uh, chord progressions as secular music, as the mind is more open to hearing it. Now, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on this. I was a drummer. I hit things. I didn't hit chords. But from what I understand and from what I have learned from a couple of people who also, or they played guitar and also got out of there, um, they used specific chord progressions. Like, you could not deviate from these chord progressions because these things are built specifically to hit something in your head to make you more susceptible to what is going in it. Again, I'm not going to be an expert on that, but that is happening. And it's the same stuff that they use in secular music with the devil stuff. And they're also doing it in CCM music as well. Song structure. This is more of my area. This is where I was um, heavily involved with. Song structure was designed to start very soft. I mean, very, very soft, whether just a pad, which a pad, if you guys don't know what that is, it's uh, an electronic thing where you hit like a certain co uh, chord, it's run through a computer, and it's just a solid note that just kind of gives background filler to the music uh, that's play being played over the top of it. If you don't know, just go on YouTube, type in music pads, and it'll, it'll give you an, an idea of what that is. Whether it's that, or just a piano, or a very soft, ethereal type of guitar, you start very soft, and then you slowly build up by the second verse, just slowly, just add, kind of add some instruments and kind of progress from there. Uh, you go to the second verse, and then usually that will lead on the next chorus further. It'll lead to a very long build up or to a very repetitious bridge. And you'll see a lot of these modern worship songs where you just see the drummer, he's just da 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 da, and they're just building for like two minutes. You see the guitar players, they're just building. And everything it's just dun, dun, dun. it's just this building it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and the voices start getting louder and everybody starts singing and you either get to a huge crescendo type of chorus or something like that or you get to a bridge where you're just repeating the same line over and over and over again just like what we read with the charity gale song the i am who i am section that's the bridge it's just the same line repeated over and over and over and over and over again because at this point as you've gone through all this stuff, every bit that's been played in, whether it's the uh, ambient music that was beforehand, the lights and the, uh, amb uh, the ethereal sound of the music that you're getting, the song structure, everything has now played into the person's mind and their body where they're now open to, if you start repeating something over and over and over again, you start chanting something, their mind will then start to hold on to that, even if it's just subconsciously. And yes, psychology plays a major part in how Satan plays these games. This is all built specifically. And after that huge crescendo, after that repetitious bridge and all this stuff, it'll drop down back to basically soft, just like at the very beginning of the song. Because most of the time, they're either loading up for the next song, which will do the same thing, or they're loading up for the message that's coming. These song structures, structures are built specifically for that. Not every song follows that, but the majority do. Lyrics are specifically designed, they are specifically designed to be hollow, vague or generalistic, cheap, and easily remembered. Again, we talk about the money side of this build it to sell the focus is usually built on self or a general entity a lot of these songs it sounds like you don't know if you're singing to god or your boyfriend or girlfriend it's designed specifically for that very repetitious lyrics with ethereal swelling guitar keys and pads again this is a mood setter get your body calm relaxed ready to accept anything that comes your way this is proven these are techniques that if you want to dive into psychologists where they've done tests, you can even go back to 
the MK Ultra type of programs, they did the same thing. Where if you get somebody in the right mood, you get them their body relaxed, you get their mind relaxed and open through um, sights and sounds, and then you repeat something over and over again. Even if it's subconscious, they take it. It sticks. It gets in there. There's an imprint. This stuff is real. And they use it. Satan uses it in Christian music. Now, playing 30 or 40 minutes of this music will allow the speaker to have an audience mentally primed and prepared to take in the message, even if they are, may not fully agree with it. This is their way of bypassing the brick wall that's set up. A lot of people, they don't go in with the mindset of, I disagree with this guy, so I'm going to be on guard. No, they just go in and go, I'm going to a church service. And even if they don't fully agree with what the message might be, after going through 30 or 40 minutes of all this sight and sound and everything that's been played to it, your subconscious, your mind is open to it. This is spiritual warfare, guys. This is spiritual warfare. And this is not some conspiracy thing. I'm not making this up. This is stuff that is really done with modern day worship music. It really is. Satan has done this. And he does the same thing in secular music as well. It's a different structure how they do it, but it's, it's all the same. You're going to follow this plan because it works. The music, the mood, the lights, the structure, and the lyrics all create a psychological enchantment with white magic. The music, the mood, the lights, the structure, and the lyrics all create a psychological enchantment with white magic. When you put the 30 or 40 mu uh, minutes of that music, some even go for a whole hour, and then you pin a short message, usually about 30 or 45 minutes, that f some of them even only go like 20, 25 minutes. You do that, you put a short message that focuses on one specific point, and then you use ear tickling subjects and stories around it to continue to drive that one point home, it'll sink in. Even if it's subconscious, even if you don't realize it, it's specifically designed to get that one thing in there. So if you're Stephen Furtick and you're teaching Little God's Doctrine and you got a 45-minute worship session with all of this going on, and then you go on there and you preach a 35-minute message about Little God's Doctrine and you use all this, this stuff to keep people entertained, ear-tickled, what they want to hear, all to pinpoint that message, those people are going to start to accept it. They're going to start to believe they're little gods. That's how it works. And then after the message, they usually follow it up with a big up-tempo or, up or bright song to finish off the service. This type of song right after, and even this is planned, this type of song right after the enchanted message, the white magic message that was just given to them, will be the cap on the bottle. And that is an actual term. It'll be the cap on the bottle or the, um, it's the, uh, the, the stamp on the brain. It's basically the snap the brain back into reality to a not, to not allow the person to question what they just heard. So what you're doing is you're putting, dumping all this stuff in the bottle and then you're slamming the cap on it. What you're doing is you're now snapping the brain back to reality with a bright, upbeat, quick, big type of song. It's completely different from all the other stuff that you just did. And it's bringing, bringing you out of like an enchantment. Like you ever, ever been, um, what's the word when you're, uh, like the watch and you get somebody to fall into like a, I can't think of the word. I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about, but when you put somebody in that and then you can kind of feed them information, it's I don't know if it, it does work, but most of them are hacks, but it, it, it is a real thing where it's like, uh, you're feeling very sleepy. Uh, when I snap my fingers, you will be like a duck type of thing or something like that. And you snap your fingers and they start acting like a duck. Well, it's kind of the same thing what they're doing doing with this. Hypnotism. Uh, hypnotism. Thank you. It's, it's basically the same thing. It's like a hypnotism. You're basically snapping the brain back to reality. And everything that they just heard, you're not giving them an opportunity to think about it. And so it's just locked in there. That's how it works. And when you have people like Hillsong, when you have people like Elevation, and you have people like 
Bethel and all of those other big churches that are writing music and, and designing these worship things. Go on YouTube and look up the live shows of these songs. It's the same. They all look identical. You can't tell the difference between the churches and the groups because all the lights, all the screen stuff, all of the music, all of the words, everything all sounds the same. Why? It's because they design it exactly like this. This is real, guys. This is real. I've sat in meetings with worship leaders and pastors who have discussed this type of stuff. I am not kidding you. Have discussed this type of stuff and then they went and implemented it in their church. And I was a part of it. It's real. And this is why I'm so against this type of music. That's why I warn people if you've got people that don't have an understanding of Jesus and the gospel, you do not partake in anything that they're creating. They are unqualified for that position. They are unqualified. And so when I talk about this stuff, again, I, I really want to hit home about this. I don't take joy in this. I don't take joy in calling people out. I don't. I get worked up. I get emotional about it. Because I know what they're doing is sending people to hell. And when I see headlines like Sean Foich says 98 people came to Christ during Satan Con, I can't, I can't accept that. I can't. Be, I, that's why I'm so skeptical about it. I just don't believe it. Because I know the gospel and the Jesus he worships, which is false. I saw pictures of these quote-unquote evangelists that were there saving people. No. No, I, I can't. And so when I warn people about these names, and I warn people about the false gospel and the false music and, and all these things, it's because I'm concerned about the souls. Just like the, the pastor in that Left Behind clip that I started this off with. It was, he knew the message. He knew the words. He preached that message. He preached those words. But he didn't believe. He just knew that was it. Knowing and believing are two different things. And why it's so important that we get the gospel right, we don't add to it, we don't make it complicated, but at the same time, we don't simplify it too much. It's because there's going to come a day when that rapture happens, and it's soon, that there's going to be a lot of people left behind. I want to show you guys this.
there's a, there's going to be a lot of people. A lot of people that thought they received the gospel message and the message of Jesus. They're going to be left standing there. And the rapture happens. Sorry, guys, give me a second. And so when I'm aggressive and I'm hard about these shows, like The Chosen and stuff, and, and the music and these pastors and these teachers and these preachers and these evangelists and everything. Why I'm hard about that and why I'm, I'm, I push it so much is because if they don't have the correct view of Jesus, if they're not giving somebody the proper gospel and they're not teaching them how to truly accept Christ, they're sending people to hell whether they know it or not, a lot of them do. A lot of them are in it for the money. But there's a lot that even them, even themselves, they're deceived. And there's going to be a lot of people that sit in the pews every Sunday that are going to be left behind when Christ comes to snatch us away. And so, if you don't know the Lord, and you don't know Jesus, and you don't want to be like the pastor in the first clip, or, or like those people standing on the street in the second clip, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. You need to believe in who He is and what He did. And it's, and it's, it's so simple but you don't just know and repeat words. It's, it's, a, it's a step of ABC. Is you, first you admit that you're a sinner. You know that you've done wrong. You know you've messed up. And you turn to repentance. You repent from your ways. And you understand that you need Jesus Christ to save you. That's the first step. Is You have to understand that you fall short. You are not good. And you have to accept the Lord. And then B is you believe. You don't know. You believe in your heart and in your soul and your mind that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God. That He came down 100% man, 100% God, lived the perfect life, died on the cross, defeating death. He rose again on the third day. And He did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for anybody willing to believe in him. So you know that you fall short. You admit your sins. You repent from them. And then you believe in Jesus Christ. You believe that he is who scripture tells us he is. God, living God's word. God's, he breathed that book. You believe that Jesus Christ is who he is. And he said what he, and he did what he said he did which he did. And then see you call upon him. That's when you say the prayer. It's not hollow words. It's not knowing the, the story and then just repeating after anybody. No. It's you believe. You admit. You believe. And then you call upon the Lord. You say, Lord Jesus, I fall short. I messed up. And I know that you are the son of God, that you came down, died for me, and rose again on the third day. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Transform me and save me. If you truly believe you have turned away from your old ways, you know that you messed up, and you believe in Jesus Christ, and you know that he can save you and take all of that away and transform your life, and you call upon him, you will be saved. That is the true gospel. That is the true gift that Jesus Christ gives us.
There's nothing more complicated to it, but there's nothing less to it either. Follow the true Jesus that is in the living word. And don't follow the words and the teachings of these worship leaders and these these preachers that have no idea themselves who the true Jesus is. And you will be saved. That's it, guys. That's all I got. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you for being here tonight. I know I went way late, um, but there's a lot of stuff to get through, and I didn't want to leave any of it out because I think it's all very important. So um, be very careful, guys. Remember, be discerning, and it's not between right and wrong. It is between right and almost right. It's very important. Be careful who you follow, who you read, who you listen to. Because there's a lot of people out there that they're in positions of leader, Christian leadership and they're unqualified for it because they don't even know Jesus Christ themselves. So be careful. All right, guys, I'm going to leave you here. That's all I got. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because you got to wake up and get to church tomorrow, whether in person or online, doesn't matter, get there. Uh, but yeah, so like, share, subscribe if you guys can. Um, get this out to as many people as you can. Not about views, not about butts and seats, but it is about getting the warning out, getting people to Jesus and Jesus to people. So that's why we do it. Uh, if you want to follow me, Rumble, Odyssey, Telegram, uh, backup channels and news channel and all that stuff, you guys know the, know the, know the spiel. Um, and then if you guys want to support this ministry and, um, uh, and, uh, the Lord places it upon your heart, uh, donation links down below, cash app, Venmo, give, send, go, um, all that stuff again, you know, you know the spiel. So, um, but yeah, so I'm gonna leave you guys here. Thank you again for joining me. I appreciate all of you guys. I apologize for getting weepy and, and all that stuff here at the end. But uh, yeah, get to church tomorrow, guys. And um, tell somebody about Jesus. Tell somebody about Jesus. And if the Lord does not come by next Tuesday or this coming Tuesday, i got to get myself out of the habit of that. But if he doesn't come by Tuesday, next Tuesday, same time, same place, I'll see you guys here. All right. Peace out. Maranatha.
You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.